Jesus Christ. Good morning. <clears throat> well, does time go by? It seems, seems like yesterday was Christmas. <laughs> and here we have the Feast of the Holy Family. And don't they go hand in hand, hand in glove, just made for each other? I'm confident that most of us are acquainted with the famous gospel reading with the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph going with a group of pilgrims to Jerusalem when Jesus was lost, thinking he was returning with them. And then they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. As you might imagine, as parents, particularly on this Feast of the Holy Family, we sympathize, we empathize with how they felt. Three days they were looking for him. We had a few similar experiences with our eight children. Two examples will suffice. <laughs> Peggy was at a local drugstore in Brighton, and we had five children with her. They got into the van to return, and as our usual procedure, there was a roll call vote. And missing was our son, Tim, probably about seven at the time. Back to the drugstore, quick return, and there was Tim talking to the pharmacist. Well, we took it as a sign that in the future he might become a doctor, which was the case. He's an ear, nose, and throat doctor in Holland, Michigan now. The second example was a little more dramatic and traumatic for us. The family was uh, at Niagara Falls, and one of our sons, PJ, he was about five or six at the time, was wearing a blue Navy uniform, proudly inherited from his older brother. And at the falls, there's, as you know, there's an elevator that goes from the bottom of the falls to the top and back, back down again. Well, we were at the top of the falls, and we decided to take our usual roll call vote. And sure enough, PJ was missing. Well, we immediately brought this, contacted a, a park ranger, and gave him a description of PJ, including the little sailor uniform he's wearing. After a tense two or three minutes, he came back and he said, yes, there is a boy fitting that description at the bottom of the falls, and he's being entertained by a group of people. I said, okay. So we took the elevator down. I have to tell you, it was one of the longest elevator rides I ever took. It seemed like it took forever to get down there. But when we arrived, there was PJ in the middle of a group of sailors enjoying the attention he was receiving. <laughs> and that's when we knew the Holy Spirit was with us when we dressed him in that uniform that day. This gospel should make all parents feel just a little bit better. Because here's the Holy Family losing Jesus for three days, the Son of God. Can you imagine how they felt? We've lost the child. <laughs> but three days is significant. And looking at this episode in the Gospel, what it does is it marks the end of the childhood of Jesus. He's now 12 years old. He's been bar mitzvahs. And under Jewish law, that means he now is entitled to adult qualifications and privileges. So he takes upon himself to go to the temple, which he calls his father's house. And he tells his blessed mother, did you not know, mother, that I must be in my father's house? Now, Jesus wasn't talking about geography. His mission had opened up before him. He realizes. And apparently, though, St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother aren't buying really into this, because when they saw him, while Mary was very relieved, she still had that anxiety. And she said, how could you do this to us? Three days. Then, of course, he tells her, that I must be about my father's business. The writer of this gospel is Luke. 
And that's significant because not only was he Paul's favorite writer in terms of the, all of the um, writings of Paul, but Luke was the only non-Jew that's ever had anything put into the Old or New Testament in the modern Bibles. So he was kind of important. And you see, Luke believed from his writings that God is walking with us at all times. And that's something that we as parents have to keep in mind. Our Lord is walking with us, with each of us, with our children, with our families. Anyway, Mary says to Jesus, son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And that moment gives us an insight into Mary. She is an incredible person. And she was very, very special, of course. Yet the wonderful thing about Mary is that in this case, she defended her husband over her son when she says, why have you done this to us? And he responds, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And having said this, the gospel tells us he went down with them and came to Nazareth. So even though he's the son of God, he went down with them to that town of Nazareth. And even though he's the son of God, the gospel reads, and was obedient to them. Now, most of us have difficulties with that word obedience. We like our freedom. We like to have explanations before we do anything. But in God's world, there's this reality. You give of yourself, and that's it. Because our Lord says, come, follow me. And that's why he tells us that we do not belong to the world, that we belong to God. And we must remember that. That's what it means to be a Catholic Christian. Our Lord gave us the example of dying on a cross. That means real sacrifice. It means loving people. You see, when we were born, we were born to live all of our expectations ahead of us. When our Lord was born, he was born to die for us so that we might have eternal life. And so at the end, on the cross, our Lord would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And this is the beginning of that great struggle for the rest of our Lord's life. That was his goal, to die for us on the cross. Now, Mary and Joseph did not fully understand what he was telling them. The gospel doesn't say they refused. It just says they did not understand what he was telling them. And so what did our Lord say to them? Well, we don't know. It's not written down for us. What the gospel tells us is that he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient with them. And Mary, being a very wise mother, a very wise lady, said, as the gospel tells us, she kept all of these things in her heart. So this gospel incident is a turning point for Jesus. He realizes he's the Messiah, the one who will change the world. And the world will never be the same. And isn't that the case? It's never the same. So we celebrate this incident, this gospel reading, 
the end of Jesus' childhood. It's a great end. He loves his mother. He loves St. Joseph. And our Lord gathers a kind of aurora about him, a holiness that is there to the very end. And what does he expect of us? That's the question. Obedience. Fortunately, we can read what that is expected from the very second reading in today's readings, from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. Here are just a few lines. I'd ask you to carefully listen to these lines because it's our Lord telling us what we should be doing, what we should expect, what we can do as parents. Brothers and sisters, as God's chosen ones, let us put on holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And if one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also do. And over all of these, put on love. That is the bond of perfection. Dear sisters and brothers, let the peace of Christ control your hearts. Our society depends on the viability of the family, my dear brothers and sisters. As parents and as children, you are vital and you are the future of our society. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Amen? Amen. God love you.